what's going on? My name is Todd Anderson with avnirvana.com and welcome to another edition of AV Nirvana Live. And today we have a round table discussion. We're going to dig into Cedia 2022 and give all of you guys an insight into what we saw and what we liked. And uh, let me bring on our guest today. We have Mark Henniger. Mark New editor at Sound of Vision. Uh, congratulations, Mark. That's really awesome. Well deserved. And uh, co owner of iMagic Digital, correct? Mark, you're a yes. photographer. Yeah, yeah. 25 years. Uh, my wife and I have had uh, photographic and video business as well. Right on. And uh, I've seen a lot of your photos on LinkedIn and stuff, and they're spectacular. Thanks. Great stuff. And of course, you're a Philly guy. I have a long history up in Philly. My kids were born there, I was married there. Um, love Philadelphia. Uh, so that's a plus one for you. <laughs> she sticks up so great. That's right. And we also have John Siaka. John is principal at Custom Theater and Audio that's down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He's a reviewer and blogger for Residential Systems, publisher of Cenelux. And if that's not enough, a technical editor at Sound and Vision. John, how do you, I mean, how do you juggle all that? It's it's a lot of working all the time. <laughs> it's just it's a little bit for a lot of people. That's what it is. <laughs> right on. Well, it's really I think it's really cool that you bring in the the custom integrator angle into things. That's a unique viewing point. Yeah, that's always been kind of my hook is that, you know, I I look at stuff from the eye of, you know, if you're going to buy it as a customer, you know, what is the customer looking for? And I'm I'm one of the few writers that can actually hook it all up program it install it make it work climb up in the attic <laughs> the whole deal so uh. right on and little known fact and i just found this out at cedia you are a former golf pro which is yeah it's a, 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 a club golf pro as opposed to somebody you see on tv Still. um but yeah i was uh i worked at a, a private country club a really private country club in the bay area for like six years um, at my best, um, I was a 0.5 handicap, so not not quite a scratch, but um, I could I could hold my own against the members. That's close enough for me. I mean, yeah. For all of you out there, if you ever run into John, don't play golf against him. No, me. that was you know 25 plus years ago. I don't know that I could legit break a hundred today. Um, you know, but um, you know, don't run into me. You know, back in the late 90s, then I would really I'd, I'd bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. We also have Travis Ballstad. He's part of the AV Nirvana team. He makes uh, content, uh, creates content for us, and he reviews products for us. And Travis, you're also a creative storyteller, I guess, is how you kind of position yourself. That's what it's morphed into. I was a, a journalism major with a focus on the, the media production side of thing. And as the industry has changed, I went from, you know, being working out of newsrooms and, you know, corporate video world, the live sports world, all that world uh, to kind of the one man band doing it all yourself. Um, you know, those tend to be the better roles these days if you have all those skills. And I just happened to have them. And you right. know, I'm, I'm one who came into this as just someone who bought the stuff and read the magazines that these guys were were writing for um, over the years and just reached out to you several years back and said, you need some help creating stuff, you know? And I just started doing it in my spare time and been doing more and more and really, yeah, uh, really enjoying it. Yeah, Meeting you killed some it of my at, heroes. At Cedia. <laughs> yeah, at Cedia this year, you did a great job. Uh, lots of Thank good you. coverage. Check it out on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Um, so we're here to talk about Cedia. Um, I'm sure you guys were absent last year. Maybe Mark, you were there. I did not go. I did not go. Yeah, most people didn't. So uh, the new numbers came out. Uh, they said they had about fifteen thousand plus registered. It was close to about sixty or fifteen sixteen thousand, and it looks like just shy of twelve thousand people showed up this year. They had forty uh, percent of that number were new attendees, which I thought was a really interesting stat. I would have assumed it would have been more of just regulars, but uh, maybe John, the industry has grown that much. Well, I think the thing, honestly, for that is, you know, companies have changed a ton over the last time. And I think they're, they have new staff, they're bringing new people. So, you know, it's probably not 40% of new companies, but like, you know, 
when you bring a team of people, you know, if you bring four people with you, if those three of them are new or two of them are new, you know, that across the board, it certainly adds up to new people. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if a three year, if you just looked at three years apart, if you'd get that kind of thing anyway, like that the three year factor seemed to be a big thing this year, just in terms of all these companies having this backlog of stuff to show that they'd never really shown in a show before. Normally the less that's new to, to demo as it were. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, and the demos, uh, the, uh, the exhibitors came back in force this year. I know they dropped like flies last year. I mean, it was crazy uh, how many people dropped out at the last second, but uh, 317 exhibitors and we had some newcomers. SVS is first time there uh, with their new end wall sub, which was cool to see them kind of making their first appearance. Um, but yeah, it, it felt full, but it didn't feel as full as it was a few years ago. I don't know if you guys felt that way. I'll tell you what, to me, because I went to CES this January, and I mean, it, that felt super light. Um, and not only did it feel light, but like the manufacturers in Sony had like no consumer electronics in their booth. LG had literally nothing in their booth, but like wow. QR yeah, codes. Plywood. <laughs> yeah, plywood. But it, it was nice that it wasn't this just crush of people, right? Like you could go into a booth and actually talk to people. And I think that was like really, to me, it was, it was amplified like that at CD because not only was all the stuff there, but the booths were really staffed up. So mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, honestly, you know, I'm okay with there not being a thousand other people in that booth with me. You know, you get a chance yeah. to actually spend some time and where they don't feel like they've got to move on. You don't feel like you have to move on. So I mean, it, it was nice. It didn't, it didn't feel small the way that CES felt small, but it mm -hmm. also didn't feel overwhelming. But to me, it was like that perfect sweet spot of there was a lot of people there, but even beyond, you know, 12,000, 5,000, 50,000 people, the thing is everybody that you talk to genuinely seemed happy and excited to be there. And, you know, in the past, this is, I'd have to do the math, but I think this is like my 25th CDF. Like I've gone to every single one since 98 except for last year and then in 99. But a lot of times you get like this kind of bitterness, like, ah, oh, man, another show. Here we go again. But I, there was yeah. none of, everyone was like just really happy to be there. And I like the vibe was just really cool. And that's what I think everybody yeah. fed on. I wouldn't yeah. disagree with that. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were definitely a lot of handshakes, a lot of hugs, and yeah. a lot of smiling faces walking around. You still had to finagle your way into the the, the popular demos, though. It wasn't that light. There, there were lines. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I know we're going to talk about it later, but like the the Trinov, you know, the shared Trinov, Sonus Favor, blah, blah, blah. That, that had a line open to like literally when the show floor closed on the last day. I mean, so it's like... It, it, you know, quality brings out people, right? And it's like, you know, if you if you bring in the goods, you, people are going to line up to see it. Right. Yeah, we'll definitely be touching on that room. Uh, and yeah, you're right. They had a line 30, 40 people deep at all times, it seemed. Yep. So, uh, so what we're going to do today, we're going to run through some product categories. If I can dig up some pictures, I will. Otherwise, uh, once this video posts on YouTube, We'll drop some links down below to uh, um, over to residential systems, sound and vision, and over to AV Nirvana, where you can search around and find some articles that have been written, videos that have been created about the products that we're going to be talking about. Um, so just to kick things off today, I wanted to talk about two brands with you guys that were just seemingly everywhere. And that was Mad VR and Kaleidoscape. Mark, I mean... I don't remember a time when Kaleidoscape was at 30 different vendors on the yeah, show Yeah, they floor. must have been building extra boxes to, to, to supply <laughs> the, that, that show, wouldn't you think? And uh, yeah, and, and definitely VR, Mad VR's presence was, was was really big too. That's really great for, that Kaleidoscape was there because, you know, there's no more efficient way to run a, a demo and to get the content you want up on screen. And, and you know it's, you know, top notch. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, the, the thing is, uh, and, and this is sort of maybe something we'll get into, but of course, those mad VR boxes were kind of necessary because in the end, uh, what the Kaleidoscapes are serving up for HDR is master for TV monitors. And what we had to do is get it to look as best as possible on these various different uh, 
you know, projectors. And that's, sure. that's definitely a way to, to make sure that you're getting that. Yeah. And that, that, that 30 number on Kaleidoscape is, is, is a very, very, uh, low estimate i think i think that was their official partners at the show but there were more than 30 kaleidoscape systems in that building it was i mean like like mark said there's no better way to run it um i, I know of at least two folks that i talked to on camera that i haven't edited yet that they weren't official partners but they were absolutely running it off of a kaleidoscape so they well, you know what they did a couple of years ago that was so smart is that they came up with a little intro loop that before it starts, it says something like, you know, demo provided by Kaleidoscape or yep. some some little tagline. You know, every, I mean, at this point, everybody knows what their cover art GUI looks like. I mean, yep. they know what their collections, but that was just another touch point to like, you know, let everybody know that like this was being driven by them, which I think was a really yep. smart move on their part. Yep. And also yep. what, it, what it really said to me was that, you know, like as a company, they're kind of agnostic in a way. It's like, we don't care what the projector is. We don't care what the sound system is. But if you want to have a great presentation, you just start with great content. And this is the way, the easiest way to have a pile of great content that you can access, you know, quickly, easily. I, I mean, I, I will say I've, I was the very first reviewer to ever review a Kaleidoscape system. So my history with those guys goes way, way back. Awesome. Um, I actually got a, a 12, wait, no, a 22 terabyte Terra before the show. And I had the first review on that. So I, my familiarity with them goes, is, is very deep, but mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those products that it, it really does live up to the hype. Um, yep. You know, the only, the only criticism you ever hear from anybody on that is it's expensive and it's like, yeah, yeah so is a Ferrari, but if you want the best, right. you know, you're going to pay for it. Um, exactly. So. Yeah. And, and same with Mad think, VR. I mean, they're both. Yeah. Very pricey products. I think Mad VR is coming in around fifteen grand. Is that right? But let's face yeah. it, you know, thirty thousand dollars for a home theater projector is also, you know, not yeah. The the, the totality of it, there, it's in line mm -hmm. with the price of the rest of the project. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was, uh, I, I had this theory that basically a Kaleidoscape doesn't make sense if somebody's not a movie buff. A ten thousand dollar like wolf stove doesn't make some sense to somebody who's not like really into cooking. But yeah. if you are, into but I can't tell you how many of my customers have a wolf stove and never turn the dang thing on. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> you know, that's just they they. You know, that's the that this is a topic for another day. But that's the void that this industry needs to cross. Right? Is you know people people they buy into I have to have a hundred thousand dollar kitchen even though I'm not going to ever use it. Right. But. I'm going to use my TV every day, but heaven forbid I buy something, you know, higher end than a Vizio. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like we, we need that, you know, luxury AV needs to have that same cachet as a sub zero and a wolf. Um, but you know what, well, maybe we can revisit that. <laughs> yeah. That's for next time. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. And John, you, you mentioned about how they had that powered by Kaleidoscape um, logo come down. I, I thought that was pretty cool. I would love to see them reintroduce that as an option for home users to have their own theater name appear. Well, you know, they used to have that when, when they had the premiere system, you could buy a custom introduction and it would be like, remember in the back in the day, like before a movie started, it'd be like the camera would roll up the red carpet and through the doors. And then it yeah. would end up with like the Smith family theater or something. So they, they used to do that back when you could load content on via disc. Um, but I think it was one of those things that had so little, I mean, you know, that I, I, I don't know in the, in the strato age, but it would be really simple for them to put something like that for, on their movie store that you could build it into a script. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know, I, I would love to see, you know, some of the, some of the, the do it yourself option, you know, the, the, the fake kaleidoscape systems out there have, so you can set it up to automatically play, you know, X number of movie trailers of stuff that's in my library that I haven't watched. And you can, I'd love to see, you know, oh, just four, four movie nights have some of those type of things where it downloads a couple of fresh trailers and maybe it has one of the, you know, you know, the, the Dolby animations that, that can play before, like, you know, this is, it just kind of add to that whole, you know, theater experience. The reason why we buy the big screen and, and all the speakers. I'd I'd love to see some some fun little, 
you know, options like that to customize your own, not just, I mean, they, they already have the home integration stuff with your, your lighting and your, your blinds and, and everything else. I'd love to see some more, just to add more to that theater experience. Just some of those little, you know, little nice little touches that not every system has. That's interesting comments. And Brett uh, Bjorkwist is in chat and he's saying <laughs> that it can be added to uh, sideload content. So he, it just needs to be requested and said, he said, uh, I can help get that done. So <laughs> Brett, you know, the other thing, though, for, for years they've lived, they've lived and died on, we go right to the movie and skip past all the trailers. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's almost like, you know, I, I, I get it. And it would be, it would be super cool. And you know, I, I'm sure they could technically do it. If you could just have like, like a checks box enable, you know, play X number of trailers before the movie starts. And even if you're randomly pick it, or, you know, I'm watching this movie, you've already got the metadata on John wick pick me four trailers that are like John wick or, you know, whatever. I mean, but again, they're, you know, they, they will tell you there's only so many in engineering hours in a day yeah, and they're sure. busy doing yeah. other things. So it is, yeah. I, I had forgotten about the, the, the selling it on skipping trailers and, and things like that. That's yeah. a funny point. It's not a technical. Most are nerds. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Brett says it's better to have your own trailers than FBI warnings, which is true because yeah. those things, you can't get rid of, right? Yeah. Right. What it's I loved, so remember good. back in the day, you're you're watching a Blu-ray and there's an ad for Blu-ray. It's like, look, man, I'm already in. Preaching like, <laughs> yeah. to the choir. Preach yeah, I'm good. Choir. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> it's classic. It's so painful to revisit an old disc and have that playing too. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So listen. Speaking of the the large screens, I mean, the large screen format is just getting more and more front and center at all of these events. And uh, Mark, I know you wanted to hit on a lot of these, but let's kick things off with Samsung's 110 inch micro LED screen. Essentially, it's not even a, it's not even something that they have to put together, correct? It comes as one giant sheet. Sold as a TV, so sure. Uh, except using uh, yeah the, the direct view LED tiles uh, in 4K, and so what this really means is they've gotten the individual LEDs down to a size where the exact 4K count fits within the 110 inch diagonal. Whereas when they were selling the wall, the modular part, I think they had gotten it down to maybe 135 inches. So the smaller they make the LED, the smaller you can make the 4K. So that's literally like the smallest uh, micro LED, but it makes it practical because you can. 110 inches, you can still get in uh, through doors and in an elevator. Bigger than that, what they're doing is they're packaging them in a box and you got to put it together. And what I liked about it is, first of all, it's a complete product, hangs on the wall. It's got all the Samsung processing. Uh, it's got sound, all that. Really just behaves like a TV. And also uh, the, the seams between the, the tiles, which is really the weak point to this technology, they're, they're very hard to see because, I, and I would imagine that's part of like it being manufactured. In the, I mean, maybe it's just the demo model, but you know, uh, but but when you're putting it together like that, you could probably have a very tight tolerance. So, so it was very effective because once I stepped back to a normal viewing distance, I wasn't like occasionally catching like the glimpses of the individual tiles, which to me was always taking me out of the, the otherwise excellent experience that these walls can provide. So, yeah, I love that. Uh, and, and what I really love about direct view LED is it's it's got perfect viewing angles. Uh, it achieves all the nits you need for HDR. It's got perfect blacks and it also doesn't have any screen reflection like like you get on regular flat panel TVs. So there's no reflectivity. So even in a room with lights, there, there's no like lights in the background, like, you know, reflecting off of it and, and distracting you. It's it's the pure image, whether it's it's dark or, or a bright room. So that's that's really an incredible you know piece of tech. 150 grand right now so you know unobtainium yeah. for most people but uh you know I, I love to see something that's really like prototype and, and and indicative of uh where you know where the future tech might might take us i agree I with that say, God, to, to me that was like again kind of like mark's closing comments on it i think it's i, I don't know this is going to be a real product versus just like a statement piece i mean at 150 grand you know you can buy a 100 inch sony direct view led for like 13999 you know 14,000, whatever it is or a 97 inch oled for 30 for like a tiny bit bigger size it, the price like is a tenfold increase um i don't know i mean I deal with a lot of wealthy people and it's like, even still, they want to feel like they're not values the wrong word, but it's like, they don't want to like 
I, I think the guy that's going to step up 10 inches for 10 times the price is going to be a really small number in, you know, indeed. It's almost like at this, at that price, I need it to be 150 inches or, you know. This has got to drop in price though in the coming years. I mean, it's going to it's get worth down. Pointing out that an 85 right now, you can get a good 85 for about two grand, right? 2,500 bucks. And then you're jumping up to 25,000 for a 97 inch, uh, you know, OLED. So in reality, that that 10 times increase to go from the largest like mass produced to the, you know, to the rarefied and it's 10 times more to <laughs> go straight to the cutting edge. I, I agree. No way that's selling, yeah. you know, as a six figure item, but yeah, that's, that's how things come to us. I mean, remember what plasmas were when they first came out, you know, and that's. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah but sure. even still, yeah, they weren't we... 150 grand. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they weren't yeah. big either. They were like. Yeah. Yeah. Small. And they, but again, uh, you know, like th th it has to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, and, and it always, it always starts crazy high and then they figure it out and they, you know, they figure out a way to do it cheaper and, mm -hmm. you know, chip technology gets better. I mean, it's got to start somewhere. So, I mean, it, it, thank goodness that, that the Samsungs, the Sonys, the LGs are willing to, you know, take that investment hit, right? You know, in, in the, basically it's just an R and D you know, right off toward future yeah. production, probably. Right. Yeah. I think and, I, and they're talking all, about all the little bits. Sorry, go ahead. Tom. No, go, no, go ahead, Travis. I was just, all the little bits and pieces of that technology mm -hmm. that they're, they're figuring out and they're fixing these problems are going to trickle into the more affordable sets, whether it's the entire set of, you know, they're going to have that in a smaller size, smaller price tag, or even just little, you know, the things they're learning, creating these are solving the problems on the, the sets in the big box stores and things like that. And, you know, at that price tag, who's going to buy something like that? I'm guessing few, very few homes. That's going to be in your, your lobbies of your big mega corporations, yacht. mega yacht. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, mine, mine's in the shop. Um, but yeah, I, you know, the, the, there'll be, a, be mostly corporate sales. I would bet for, for something like that, to, you know, be the big centerpiece in a lobby with today's, Today's visitors are, and it's just on the same slide for six hours a day. Well, and Mark, they're having trouble getting the micro LED in down into smaller screen sizes, correct? I mean, that's yeah, part so of the, the issue. The reason it costs so much right now is because every single one of those LEDs, and you need a red, green, and a blue one for each pixel, and you need 8 million pixels for 4K, and a robot has to plate each one of those. You, you can't, there's no mass production methodology that's efficient for this. They, they, so a robot has right. to sit there and, and place each one, and, and you have to throw away like the panels that, that get screwed up. Uh, so, yeah, you, you could they'd have to come up with a completely different uh, method of, of assembly to, to, to mass produce them. I mean, that, it's, it's a, that, that is a barrier. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, we're talking big, let's skip over uh, the short throws real quick and just jump to the really big micro led screens that we saw there planar. And uh, John, I totally agreed with your assessment on the quantum media systems room. Um, those large scale micro LED and folks, we're talking like 198 inches and larger and in the quantum media systems room. I think that was 16 or 17 feet wide CinemaScope. But what do you guys think of those screens? I, it, it, that was just flat out the best looking image quality I'd ever seen. Just period. Um, it was interesting because I, I went in on like a private press thing. So it was just, I was the only one that was in there. And the, you know, they were, so they were kind of, I think doing some other demos they didn't normally do or whatever. And the first thing they put up was the Kaleidoscape cover art screen, which I am intimately familiar with seeing on all kinds of different displays. And it was like immediately, like the colors were vibrant. There were no seams, there were no dimples. The blacks were like just pitch black. Um, it And to me, it was like a 16 foot wide OLED. It was just like, I mean, awesome. I'm super bright. Um, I think they said it would hit 1100 nits or something. You know, yep. you know, I, I mean, it, it was, and you know, in the world of how much these things cost, I think they said it was like 400 grand. Um, and it's like, you know, you could, if you could have that for 400 or the 110 inch Samsung for 150, I'm finding a way to stretch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's really the Eclipse versus that for 400 grand. And, and I would agree. Look, if people want to watch 
HDR the way it's mastered today, you got to get to a thousand nits. I mean, there's all yeah. there's really no conversation there. Uh, so yeah, that that's what makes that so impressive. Cinematic scale and scope, OLED contrast. Uh, yeah, that's and and uh, and and actually beyond OLED brightness. Here, uh, I've actually got a uh, a video. Let's see if I can share this. Of uh, there we go. There's probably audio coming through on this, but yeah, that doesn't really capture how amazing it was. No, no. Uh, it, honestly, what it doesn't even really capture is how big it was. I mean, really, right, yeah. I mean, that's that is 16 feet wide, which was just nuts. Yeah, yeah. insane. I mean, honestly, I would I would pay twenty five dollars a ticket to see a movie on that thing. Like if that was if that was in a movie theater. You know, I would way prefer that over even like a Dolby Cinema screen. It's mm -hmm. like to me, and that's maybe where that maybe where that starts, where it's like, yeah. hey, look, we're going to spend, you know, three quarters of a million dollars instead of buying a projector in a, in a screen, we're going to buy this thing. And, you know, again, maybe maybe that's ultimately where this, you know, where these things come down from. But I've, I've again, imagined thing is uh, as airbnb home theaters where people can go and rent and and and, and basically spend a night you know in a room like that yeah well because i can tell you from 25 years in doing this renting your stuff out is the best thing to do <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, one of the things i thought was really cool about that room is the audio system wisdom audio had built custom built a system just to go with that screen and it sounded really good i mean one of the yeah. complaints about these large large plant panel screens is you can't have the audio coming through the screen obviously although meyer sound is saying they're developing something where they're essentially bouncing the sound off of a screen um which i can't imagine that's going to sound as good as having the drivers actually yeah. facing out into the room like wisdom had built in there did you guys think that also sounded good or i'm i'm the i'm the i'm the case the case in point for gotta have those the sound coming from behind the screen and i looked at this thinking that's gorgeous but and then i saw it was wisdom audio i said oh it's going to sound good too then yeah. and and you know wis wisdom's you know systems just have always been you know my one of my dream systems is is what they're doing they're they're just oh it sounds so fantastic and this was no no different it just it sounded incredible and you know i suppose if i had to get the wisdom set, set up it's a sacrifice i could make to to have that display in my house as well that was magnificent we actually travis maybe you can answer this because we have a uh, another viewer question from jedi 1982 he says would you be able to comment on the audio comparisons between the wisdom audio and ascendo rooms um both were great yeah they they were fantastic both both were fantastic um different diff, just different signatures would be all i would say i would be more than happy to have either in my room um I, the as the ascendo i consider to be more commercial cinema-esque versus wisdom is just such a smooth um it's just it's like a silkier sound than than yeah. the ascendo, but maybe a, a little more to refined. each their own. Yeah, you can't go say couldn't one, go wrong with either. Difference the the rooms were like I mean the the yeah. the quantum media room was like a hotel like meeting room essentially with like the nothing walls on the side. Yeah. So I mean that it was that helps. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't built for like sound quality, right? I mean, and it was way 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 bigger than the ascendo room, right? Um, so I mean, it's it's not super fair comparisons, of, you know. True. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, not that those sound rooms are really built for sound quality. Either. I know that's so true. I mean, and, I always uh, give the nod to the the quantum media systems just because of that. It's not that kind of fake yeah. wall. Um, yeah. Yeah, they, and they have the size advantage too. Yep. Um, so, so Mark. I'm going to defer to you on this one. We saw Epson with their ultra short throw. Uh, it was the H1951QB, and then Hisense also had a, a laser ultra short throw there. What did you think of those two? Well, uh, the Hisense I, I'm familiar with. I, I reviewed that for, for Projector Central. Uh, I think I've reviewed their H9G and the PX1 Pro. Uh, 
So what I thought was that the Epson was being de that was basically demonstrated, or the High Sense, the PX1 Pro was high was uh, demonstrated in that dark room with the next level acoustics. That was, on principle, a demo that I liked very much because uh, you know, I've seen, for example, in ABS forum people exploring the idea of you know how they can set up a dark room with the UST, leverage the Rec 2020 color you get with the triple RGB laser, so on and so forth, and get a home theater experience out of a bright you know, wide gamut projector that's quite inexpensive compared to dedicated home theater projectors. And mm -hmm. it did a good job. It was, it's not a real home theater projector. There, there are issues, you could pick it apart, but honestly, it's a big, bright, you know, picture with lots of color and uh, tied together with a really powerful sound system. It, it, I actually enjoyed the the viewing experience. Uh, yeah. And, and, and be, yeah, anyway, so, so that was cool, but but what Epson was doing, well, you know, they they've got the brightest. They already had the brightest projector. What they've done is they've re-engineered what was sort of like a commercial projector that they jerry-rigged to make work with the with the, the LS500 and with the LS800. They've made a, a really slick new chassis with an extremely short, the shortest throw lens yet in an ultra short throw. It really sits close to the wall so that you can put it like a regular Ikea credenza, which is sort of what they were showing there. Yep. 120 inches even, it's, it's not sticking way out in the room, seems sharp edged edge. Those 4,000 lumens, I mean, you need as much brightness as you could possibly have to really fulfill what the UST's promise is, which is that it can kind of like survive some ambient light and be like a big TV. And and, and it was doing that. And yeah. on top of that, Epson was focusing on the kind of content that looks good under those conditions, which is to say not like a movie like Star Wars, but they were showing sports, they were showing video games. Uh, these are high average brightness level content that, 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 that looks good even, you know, because you don't have to worry about the black levels being the defining element of the picture quality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also got really low latency compared to the DLP projectors. It's got no uh, rainbow effect. So all these things I think are amazing. And so that's quite likely the best UST projector out there now because it's the brightest, the lowest latency. That's the, the Epson. Yeah, the Epson. I mean, yeah. it's it yeah. just the wall. It, you know, it does so many things that that really is, that needed to be done to bring USD technology to sort of like the next level of its evolution. And it's still a very nascent, like growing category. So it's got promise, is is what I would say. This Epson shows that this USD category. It's not just like flash in the pan. It's not just a gimmick. It's got real promise. If you keep evolving mm -hmm. it, uh, it's going to suit specific purposes. May again, maybe not the, the the dedicated home theater aficionado. Uh, you know, the Epson doesn't have the you know, the Rec twenty twenty gamut that the triple L lasers do, for example. But mm -hmm. yeah, for for that application, it's like that's great. I mean, I, I would love to have one. In essence, if I was a sports fan, uh, you know, that's bringing the sports bar projected, you know, experience to your living room without like the uh, the expense and or the problems that would be like with a with a long throw where you're not be able to like walk yeah. in front of it, cast a shadow, whatever. It's 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 good. Um, also, they're they're very consumer friendly. They gave me a little demo in the Epson room of how they basically set it up using an app on the phone. Sure. Well, that's good and bad. I mean, that's losing like <laughs> digital, like, you know, skewing and, 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 and whatever to, to make it fit. So you're losing some brightness, you're losing resolution, you're reprocessing right. image. I, I, I always want to be like, please, please, please just manually adjust it. And then set that <laughs> but still, though, there are, there's a lot of people out there that don't want to mess around, you know, with that. Yeah. They just want to press a well, button. They, and they, they tend to do it correctly. The, 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 the demo, the person running the demo was like, yeah, this is like in case somebody like bumps into it a minute before the game is on and you really need to quickly get to fix it. And you can't just sit there right. and fiddle, which is like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You know, don't just like, oh, I'm just going to be lazy and use this and then I'll leave yeah. it there for the next year. Uh, but yeah, you know, you know, it's, it's utility as something that you can set up temporarily and set up very quickly. That that that's that's a plus too, especially if, if you're aiming at that larger mainstream you know market. You know where we're trying to get somebody to spend that much money on a device. Yeah, you, it's got to really kind of accommodate uh, maybe a user who's not that yeah not that tech savvy. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Kind of on the other side of the equation, we shift over to kind of the real projectors. We had JVC. Sony, obviously, those two were up in force. JVC came with its new limited edition 25 LTD $30,000 projector, which is now the most expensive one in its lineup. Um, and I think even more exciting than kind of a little refresh on their NZ9 was the new firmware release that they're talking about bringing out, which has a tweaked uh, HDR, um, forgetting the name of the uh, 
frame adapt, HDR frame adapt, and also new laser dimming functionality that's going to bring to the table. Um, that NZ9 demo mm -hmm. though was pretty pretty sweet, which they said was just running the the new firmware with no other processing. Is that what you guys heard also? That is that's what I heard. Although they couldn't get all of it to work when I went through the demo. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> But uh, they couldn't get the video game part to work for whatever reason. Um, oh, the eight, the true 8K. No, there was. I guess somebody was live playing a video game or something. Um, maybe you guys didn't get that part either. <laughs> I saw. Uh, I saw a video. They showed a video game in 8K. I think uh, I, they were. I mean, they showed some 8K content that was like captured from a hard disk server. Um, but it was. I mean, they're you know JVC. Their, their black levels is what they live and die on. And I mean, it, it was, the blacks were fantastic. I mean, the colors were vibrant. I mean, it, it did, it looked, it looked spectacular. And honestly, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that their the limited edition projector is not a little bit more expensive. Um, I mean, it's in such a limited quantity and also, I mean, they're hand selecting parts and pieces for it. I mean, so, but I mean, that, you know, if you're in the, again, if you're in the market for a $25,000 projector to get like the very finest parts and pieces for 5,000 extra that also includes, you know, a professional calibration by Chris Deering and a leather bomber yeah. jacket. <laughs> <laughs> a a lot of that for framing. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah, lot of added value right there. Yeah. There you can see in the middle there that uh, the frame or the, uh, the plaque right in there yeah i mean that's worth a thousand bucks alone right there <laughs> that little, that's a discarded chip that didn't make the cut for any of their uh projectors <laughs> yeah yeah good stuff um and, i agree uh, that also the back levels other than uh the eclipse so you got to pay 10 times more than 10 times more above that to get a better projector uh in terms of contrast as far as yeah. i can tell yeah, John, you had mentioned in your show show wrap about the uh, the eclipse. I mean, that's just an insane projector. I'm yeah, sure that I mean, again, I work. like how the Quantum was the best video I ever saw. That the Christie was the best projector I think I've ever seen. And I think part of the difference between the Christie and the JVC was again the screen size. Um, you know, it was it was throwing that image out on a much bigger screen size. Um, mm -hmm. With again, it, it to me it felt like. I, I'm a huge fan of Dolby Cinema. Um, and, you know, if you've ever been to a Dolby yeah. Cinema, before it starts off, they show you this was black and now this is black. And it's like it, it reminded me of that, like those black levels of like. But again, when you think about what it would take to have that projector, right, you've got to have a special room for it. You've got a laser chiller. I mean, God knows what kind of power incoming you would need to, to drive that monster. It's like, I mean, that's, that's, for the guy. yeah, I mean, that's, that's for the guy who's legit building like a 30 person private home cinema. That's yeah. not, I mean, that's right. no longer home theater. I mean, that's now yeah, like Hollywood directors who would probably do that. And, uh, right. you know, and Taylor Swift or somebody, I mean, uh, you know, just a, a couple of comments on that, that, uh, that, you know, I, <laughs> The, I was talking to Joel Silver a few days ago about that particular demo, and I mentioned to him that when I was at Cedia, uh, Nigel told me that he was running it at 150 nits, and it could have gone to 150 nits, I mean, to 300 nits on the screen they had there. And Joel was like, well, they should have run it at 300, because I've been messing with 300 nit projectors, and that looks amazing. And so that's just something to note, that that projector was not, it was like sort of like cruising and second gear even even at that size even when we saw yeah it can definitely go well beyond uh, what we witnessed and 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 that would be the case for, like for that 25 seat you know mega theater but yeah. you know i had a conversation I was, I was talking to chris deering actually and if you think about it i i think that christie projector is like 400 grand maybe that's where it starts i, I mean it's it's so expensive yeah. what does it even matter but let's just say what i got from my absolute ultimate davy yeah, yeah. and then the quantum media system was like 400 grand right mm -hmm. i mean between so, the same money what would you rather have and it's like i don't have the wall, the wall. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, and I don't have to have a chiller room for this for this massive furnace of a projector. I don't have to have all the separate stuff. You know, I can watch it with lights on. I mean, I, I think that's really, that's like maybe going to be the future demise of front projection. And again, I am a huge fan of it. But mm -hmm. um, if, if, app, if, if it's the same dollar layout, 
you know, the, the ultra high net worth individual is going to want to gravitate toward the thing that's cooler, that's newer, that's tech buzz, you know, and it's also, there's no compromises. Hey, you want to watch this with the lights on? Hey, you want to do this? Hey, somebody you want to walk in front of it? Whatever. I mean, I think, I think that's ultimately going to be the, the difficulty for front projection in the super high the end. Audio thing. Cause that, cause definitely the, 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 the Christy was shining on an acoustically transparent screen, a, a woven screen. So yeah. You know, if you're really, really into the audio, uh, it, it, yeah, there's that give and take there too. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that's, you, that's the yeah, one, that's the one room. <laughs> That's the one room I was not able to make it in, um, which leads to my favorite projector of the show being the the Barco Njord that was in both the Trinov room and the Seymour room. I thought it, it's interesting. Those two rooms had the exact same video path from Kaleidoscape, Mad VR yep. to, uh, you know, the Barco Njord to the same screen material, just at different sizes. And, you know, I, I loved that image as well. I just thought it was Gorgeous. fantastic. Yeah. And uh, we've got Mark. Do you know how much that thing is offhand? Is it is it in the, the 50 range or do you know where it where the, is that the bar the barco? I'm not sure what the tag on that was, but I think it was six figures. Okay. No, I, I didn't think it was. That was like 80. You didn't think so? No, I'm, that, somebody made a comment. Anyway, I, I, I okay. struck it as relatively not crazy priced <laughs> once compared <laughs> to the Christmas. I don't we've know. We've got uh, we'll Marvin in it. chat. And this, uh, I'll see who wants to walk out onto this uh, icy pond. He's wondering how did JVC projectors compare to the Sony line? And Sony was there; they had their full lineup. They have got their, I guess you could say, relatively new twenty-eight thousand uh, dollar projector there. What do you guys think? Which the seven thousand ES demo was the worst projector demo of the show. Period. It Which awful. one? The, the, the 7000 ES, the, the, yeah. the one you're, 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 that you are you are citing, that was the worst looking demo in the show. So whoever put it together for Sony should be reprimanded for trying <laughs> to do a let's compete with UST projectors with an ALR screen like demo, which just made no sense to, to be doing with their flagship. It was. Uh, yeah, they were they wanted to do a lights on demo and they wouldn't even turn the lights down to show it to you. I mean, when I walked in there, I asked them to do it and they're like, no, that's not how we're showing it, which distressing yeah that's a shame that 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 was the case so there you go marvin without going much too much deeper into that topic uh jb that, that, that looked good in their uh in their big theater demo and the five but i will say to, to, to answer his question i did go into sony's like downstairs training room mm -hmm. um where they had like all of their projector lineups set up against all their competitors. And they would, they would put any two of them up that you wanted to see. And um, I am personally in the market for either a Z8 or a 6,000 ES. Um, that's gonna, one of those will be my next projector. So I specifically wanted to see those two projectors side by side. And um, there were compelling things about both of them side by side. Yeah, that's um, not surprising. The Sony's lens is very sharp, a lot of detail. Yeah. Um, but again, I know what JVC black levels look like, and I felt like I wasn't seeing that. They said they were out of the they were out of the box settings. You know, it's like I, I you know, I owned a JVC. I'd love to have like taken the remote and kind of whipped through it. <laughs> but um, you know, again, I, I guess the, the the thing I could say is they both they both have their compelling things to them. And I think if you had it in your house and they weren't side by side. I think you'd be really happy with either one of them. Um, but JVC, I would agree with that. Yeah. Their strong suit has always been their black levels and their contrast. Um, Sony, I think, does a better job on motion handling and also on their, their lens is it's, at that at that below the NZ9, which is a different lens, is mm -hmm. um, very sharp. To me, the outlier in their lineup is the, the 7000 for Sony. The price delta is so gigantic for 500 lumens and for a, a live color feature that most people are probably not going to even use that that to me seems like i, I don't know it's like in it, it, it just why is that one so much more expensive without you know throw the arc f lens on it or you know something um but i i think the 6000 will be the sweet spot of their lineup probably like the nz8 is a sweet spot of jbc's lineup yeah are they priced comparably 
Or are they about the JVC bucks is off? JVC? I believe is sixteen thousand fifteen nine nine nine. The Sony I think is twelve eleven nine nine nine. Okay. Well, um, I mean, so we're talking about we're talking about the six thousand versus the NZ eight. Um, yeah. I, I do want to correct myself. You now the newer is definitely a six figure protector. It's a uh, one hundred sixty four thousand, according yeah. to Brett. So. But, but agree on that. The six thousand ES is just such a clearly better value because really, like you can maybe make up for it with like a little bit higher gain screen or just shave a few inches off your screen size and end up with the same on screen brightness uh, for almost half the price. Yeah. And yeah. to just echo that you put either one of them in your room on its own and you're going to be happy. Uh, you know, it's obviously there's going to be personal preferences between the two. I like, like you, John, I enjoy the blacks on the JVC projectors. I, I just think that that's invaluable for me. Um, but I'm all my, my projectors long in the tooth and I would also be perfectly happy with the Sony up there as well. And yeah. within a couple of months, I would probably forget all about the JVC and, until the next time I was in the market, so I it was. Just, and you know, the thing is, to, like, just like JVC did, though. You know, a product now is not baked when you buy it, right? I mean, they yep, made yep. their projector better with a firmware update, and so you know, a lot of people, fairly or unfairly, whatever, they slag Sony on their, you know, their dynamic tone mapping. Sony's a huge company. If they wanted to update their tone mapping, they could do it tomorrow with a firmware update. I mean, so it's yeah. like these things are no longer. I mean, it's it's not like an Atari cartridge where when you buy the cartridge, that's it. This is the one. You right. know, it's like they're they're forever being improved. And yeah. you know, that's I think I think what these companies do to add value, right? It's like, hey, look, JBC, we're gonna roll out. This is a, this is an improvement we found that we could make in software. We're gonna give it to everybody for free. To me, that kind of stuff creates, and I can tell you as somebody who sells this stuff, mm -hmm. that resonates with customers a ton when you can go back to them and say, hey, look, there's been an update. I'm going to make your system better. It's not going to cost you anything. Yep. They love that. Yeah. yeah in fact, I, I just, I pick news out of their firmware updates. There's no question. It's, it's yeah. real news. It just, it, the one thing that the one negative to that is it draws the fine line and you get products being hitting the market before they're quite ready to be and then you get that negative feedback out of the gate and then all you know and then you don't yeah. it, it's 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 like range rovers i drive a 10 year old range rover with one hundred and fifty thousand miles on it i didn't buy it new because that's when 95 percent of the people are having issues with them because they're not ready to be on the market you know i bought it used after everyone's been through that problem and i've had no issues with it at all so yeah for more updates should be to make it better not to make Not it to work. <laughs> yeah, <Right>. exactly. <laughs> so true. Well, it got me to buy one. I just purchased an NZ8 um, sitting upstairs waiting to get installed. So I'll be right there. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that, uh, yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Congratulations. Man. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Epson was there. They're still doing 4K e-shift. This time they're, they're using a, a four-way uh, method. Did you guys pop in there and see see the Epson demo? The twelve was that in the was that in the Omni hallway? That was in the hallway. Yep, next yeah. next what? to the short throw room. I every time I walk by, the door was shut, um, or like private meetings in progress or whatever. So you didn't pop in. It's essentially a five thousand dollar projector. I mean, talk about bang for your buck. I think there's a lot to be said for what they're doing. It looks really good. Um, Mark, did you jump in there? I did not have time to do that. I just did the UST with Epson. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think Epson's still doing what they do best is offering that really kind of entry level price point with decent performance. Oh, what great, I, what for, I there, great for gamers. It's a, it's a little less expensive than the Sony 5000 ES and, and the real differentiator is Epson's got a really good lens for the money that's also a power lens with, with lens memories. So somebody who wants to do the scope scene, you know, screen and all that, they can do it with the, with the Epson. Whereas the Sony, you know, you get a little better, the 5000 ES even, you, you get a little bit better contrast than, than Epson's offering, a little better black levels. So, you know, if, if you're just going to do a 16 by 9 screen and you want, 
and it's also native 4K. So you know, mm -hmm. if you're if you want to push the image quality on a fixed screen, you just set it up once. Maybe the Sony, but yeah, if you want that uh, that scope and that adaptability, then Epson. I think they're very competitive with each other, but but with really clear differentiating capabilities. Yeah, in talking about setup, the one thing I did not like at all about the Epson room was uh, they had motion smoothing engaged, and it just it didn't look cinematic. It was right. it was just too much, you know. It just had that soap opera look, kind of floaty. Uh, I think they would have been a lot better off with that off, but uh, maybe that's just me. Um, okay, so moving on, because we've got about 10 minutes left on our hour here. Let's jump into screens and Travis, let's kick this off with Seymour Screen Excellence because you spent a lot of time over there. They yep. uh, introduced a new masking system at Cedia. I Honestly, it, 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 it won the, what the projector central best in show product. I, I can't believe no one's come up with this before. It's, it's a fantastic way for someone who's got a great scope aspect ratio screen that they, they love and they don't feel like upgrading the screen itself, but just to give them, uh, I think the price, Todd, do you have it there? Was it like $1,400 uh, regardless of the size? It's like 1300 um, bucks. Yeah, 13, I thought it was yeah. just over a thousand, like eleven yeah. hundred or something. But it's, well, yeah, it's around eleven ninety five is maybe what it was. Chris is going to kill yeah. me. Um, I have but I, it's it's uh... it's a it's a great idea. It's a great product. It's going to save a lot of people a lot of money for buying something that they don't need, but you know, one of those cool features that they like. I I've got the Seymour Proscenium motorized masking side panels, and I just. I'll sit there and go back and forth every once in a while just because it's it's fun to to watch. It's cool. It's just like adding those custom trailers to the start of a show. You know, it's kind of that that pizzazz that can liven up a, a movie night, you know, when you have friends over or guests over. It's a it's a cool feature and and I'm surprised no one's come up with it yet. And they'll fit on any manufacturer's screen. They've got them so they're adaptable so it doesn't have to be a Seymour screen to uh to yeah. attach and that's there you go you can that see that's right 950 there. a pair not yeah. see a pair but i got the number from, from i'm pretty six. sure it was uh is that 12 1295 yeah it's 1195 or 1295 i'll i'll look right now because i've got that I, video okay i got it this is residential systems though john so it's it says that right. <laughs> that, that's, that looks that's like it's from a different show yeah it's i think it's from a different show that's yeah. retro mask so maybe this is an old old image i will say um uh, one of the things one of the things that i think is so great about it is that a screen is generally something people only want to buy one time Mm -hmm. um, it's really tough yeah. to get a customer to like make a screen upgrade unless they like can go much bigger. Right. I mean, generally like a screen is a, is a, you marry your screen, you date your projector. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, this is a way, I mean, if you've never had a masking system before, it really does like make the image more cinematic. And if you if you have a scope screen, this is a small investment to really make it a, a better presentation. And compared to like what an actual like the the masking that Travis has, generally masking for the manufacturer, it's such an expensive option because it's motorized. It's got to be built in. You're not adding it after the fact. Um, I, I think this is just one of those super smart products that somebody looked at this and said, Hey, this, you know, this would be really easy to do and it will make it better. Um, so I, my, my only thing is it, it only works with a fixed screen, obviously. Um, it would, you know, it would be great if there was somehow a way to make it work with a motorized screen. But, um, I, yeah. I think it's, I think it's great. And if I'm not mistaken, Travis, maybe you can, you can correct me. It's also, it'll work with, um, it's acoustically transparent, right? So you can put speakers yep. behind it. Yeah. It's, so, it's the same, it's the same fabric as the, pa the panels on my screen. And, uh, I, he does, he, he does have a retractable screen that you can get retractable masking panels for that you just, you know, depending on what, setting you choose when you bring drop it down it'll bring the panels with or 
or it won't. Um, so I would imagine that it might be on the future uh, roadmap to to add some sort of add-on for a retractable as well. You know, like I said, well, his probably not have that or whatever. I mean, the, how to probably how to not. how to configure it to. I don't know. I just I think it was you know having having been an installer. You know, I joined our company in '98, and I can't tell you how many times you'll you'll put something in, and you're like. The guy that designed this has never actually installed this thing. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. this product was so smart. You can just tell that they really put some thought into it. Yeah. Um, not only to address a problem, but also to like make a great solution. So, I mean, I, I love that when companies do that. MSRP is 1295. 1295. Which is funny because I pulled up the video that I shot at Cedia there and the signage says 1195. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's right so here. Nobody I got knows. The nobody I got knows. The press sure. Yeah, I no, think I it's twelve ninety five. Okay, yeah. yeah, I looked at the press release uh, earlier today too when I was drawing up the show notes, and um, that's what I remember seeing. So, well, hey, I can show you this too. This is a picture, a close up I took. Can you see that? Hold on, John. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. Maybe uh, you know, adjusted for inflation. inflation. So, can you show that again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it's somewhere between nine nine ninety nine and twelve ninety five. That's I think it. It's twelve ninety five. Yeah. Um, and then the other screen I wanted to touch on was this uh, EDP screen, Dark Star Max UST, which was shown in the uh, Epson room over on the Omni uh, walkway. And uh, Mark, I know you saw it. It was uh, being used with a UST in there. Yeah. Um, very cool screen. Basically, it's a ambient light uh, re uh, rejecting screen that folds down or goes down into a box that you can build into like a table, for instance. So it can completely disappear. You can have a 100 to 110 inch screen um, or up to 120 inches, actually, uh, that disappears um, and very cool stuff. Yeah, not the only thing of its kind, but what they were talking about there was how, uh, and, and I could feel it, it the, the screen material itself is uh, is very thin and stretchy uh, as opposed to the more like plasticky uh, wow. particular screens. Yeah, so so its stretch is really flat, which is, is super important for, for UST, like, like any warping or whatever, like gets magnified because of the extreme angle that it projects at. So, so mm -hmm. just the, the way that, that that material and the, and the tab tensioning works on that, it, it really flattens it very nicely. And, and that's what you want. Uh, so yeah, I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a very cool you know, accessory for USTs and, and probably a necessity to, to make that category really like blow up because yeah, no, people don't like big gray squares on their wall. I hear. I yeah, just <laughs> not. not I, I, I love a lot. I love a lot of these new, uh, you know, solutions for for projection systems. I just kind of waiting for them to get. You know, we had a dedicated room in the previous home before we moved, and this is more. You know, I've got my office back here. It's more wide open to the laundry and everything. So we're kind of still finishing things up and straddling the multi-purpose room slash dedicated theater and i you know i'm watching all these new ideas and options very closely but for now nothing's in my opinion nothing is comparing to this yet yeah if they're getting well, close I would, they I are would say, and mark has way more experience i i just finished reviewing my first ust projector and i you know they still want to sell it to you as a tv replacement and it yep. it is not and it's like, if you look at every advertisement, it's a brightly lit room and it's like, you know, all the lights are on and everyone's like, it's a perfect, and it's like, that's not the reality under the best yeah. of times even. Yeah. And like, the it other thing is that- A hamburger you see on a TV commercial, it's like, you're not getting that ever. Yeah, it's yeah. also <laughs> like a lot, in, in a lot of cases, these really good ALR screens could be twice as much as the projector. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, Okay, sure, your projector is twenty five hundred dollars, but now you need a fifty two hundred dollar screen yep. to go with it. Yep. I don't know. I, I feel like that it's it's going to lead to consumer unhappiness when they get it home, 
because they're going to expect it to look like mm -hmm. a big giant LED and it's never going to look that way in, in a fully yeah. lit room. And, um, and for me, I was looking, you know, looking at scope options and they just aren't there. You know, I wanted to have the scope screen just, yeah. you know, you, it's not a real option with an, with a UST yet. Yeah. Like Mark said, it's, though, I mean, if you if you put one in your living room, it's a great way to show yeah. like a game, uh, video gaming. Yeah, it's your sweet spot for 120 inches. I, I I'm not that excited about 100 inches now that we've got 100 inch TVs out there. But yeah, and it's also smart that Epson sells their own screen and, and sells it as a package with the with yeah. the projector, so, yeah. so that you know, you know you're. But yeah, I, I think that is again, it's it's a very new category, and I think they're uh -huh. kind of like printers used to be like like going through like this rapid evolution and then they'll eventually reach some plateau but they're not there at all you know we're seeing so many competitors yeah i, I did the yeah. projector central like uh, ust shootout and there were 16 different models there and one thing i was remarking on is like there's more projector makers than there are tv makers there's more projector yeah. models and they're coming out like each year like like with something new and and so yeah it, it'll yeah. be interesting to see where it lands and 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 hopefully they do uh, start to take hold a little bit, and and some of the actual screen manufacturers, you know, put a little more effort into designing a screen specifically for this, with you know, with their R and D and history and materials. Uh, you know, I'd like to see. I, obviously, the the better pieces come from the better, the more experts in the field. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the, that's nice to see them take this take this platform and make it upgradable mm -hmm. uh, so you have a lot less waste. I just want to comment that Epson and also the TV makers, they make USTs that have color management systems that you can actually tweak and get good color. Uh, there are other USTs that, that that's, that's their real weakness that, that you can't, yeah. you, you can't work with the, you can't calibrate them. You, you can't even tweak them, you know, beyond just what comes out of the box. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's like a dividing line for me and, and, and a strength that the I sense and, and Epson you know, have over uh, some competitors and let LG too, since they're in that game. Yeah. Hell, Samsung might even come up with a sequel to their USTs. If they do, then you know the category is still alive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Samsung still <laughs> in, right? <laughs> yeah. They're the first to leave. Mm -hmm. um, all right, guys. So let's wrap this up with uh, talking a little shop about receivers. Um, you know, my kind of take home from the show was high channel count is the new game this is the new avenue for manufacturers uh to sell products to the higher end user um you know Marantz and denon both showed up with uh 15.4 channel receivers or well actually Marantz's was a, a preamp correct that dot the, four man that's what we should be talking about the av10 yeah because that that four sub output that's, that's awesome that's a big deal for, for home theater fans. It's a big deal. And, you know, they also Odyssey has worked with them to uh, create a room correction package uh, that will correct each output individually, which I think is really cool. In addition to uh, Derek coming on board, which is probably the biggest news of all. But uh, what do you guys think? Yeah. What And, and then Denon's uh, A-H, uh, a, is it A-1-H or A-H-1? A-H-1. Um, A-H-1. Um, another 15.4 channel, uh, receiver. I, I would, I've always said that if I ever went back to an, an AVR and all in one, it, it would pretty much have to be a Marantz. I've always really loved that Sonic sign signature. I actually spoke with uh, a couple of the guys from sound United to try and really, you know, dig into to why it sounds so much better than a Denon that are, you know, equally, equally, uh, built and matched and better, of course, subjective opinion, but, you know, just talking about the power supplies and, and component selections, just, I, I prefer the Marantz though, the storm audio, you know, hearing what they're able to do, that that'll be an interesting, uh, product to see when it, when it hits the market. That's the uh, ISR Fusion 20. And that, I mean, that's really in a league of its own when it comes to that mm -hmm. kind of, it's a, probably three times the price. Um, yeah. The, the Marantz AV10 and their their Amp10, I believe as a package, it's 14,000. Does that sound right? Yeah, they're seven a piece. Seven a piece. I mean, that's a lot. Uh, Marantz is really pushing up 
on the ceiling of, of how much their products are costing. I know a couple of years ago when they first came out with the redesigned look that they were talking about trying to push the, the brand more upstream from denim. So, I mean, they're achieving that, but the pricing yeah. and Shows maybe it. some of that's inflation. But... Oh, there's that capability in there too, though. It just seems like they're paying, you're getting your money's worth on the R and D and a new AVR that's not this list small incremental, mm -hmm. but like you said, you know, you get to choose between Odyssey and, 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 and direct that's like, you know, Thank you. And, and you get to now, the, like John, just to answer some guy's question, you get to do the, 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 the preamp mode uh, for individual channels and not just an all or nothing situation. I, I was like blown away, really, by, by the fact that Morantz had such a complete refresh and, and, and yeah. really brought so much useful you know, capability to the table. Well, especially if you compare it to who else is in that 19 channel arena. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, now you're in with the storms, you're in with the tree knobs, you know, you're in with the Steinway Lingdorfs and all of a sudden 7,000 is a, is a bargain. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. like, you know, a, a, an entry level tree knob altitude 16, I think it's 17,000. I mean, it, it, in that ballpark, mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, yes, it's expensive for Morantz, but compared to who else is able to do that, I mean, you're in rarefied air at, you know, at that many channels. Um, and I think, too, you know, like you guys have been saying, Odyssey feels like it's been getting stale for, you know, a, a while. Right. We haven't been yeah. seeing like a lot of, you know, upgrades and like it was it was originally supported by everybody. And now it's like, you know, it's only DNM. Um, so, you know, that they would embrace, Hey, look, you know, if you don't like Odyssey, here's another option for you. You know, it's not mm -hmm. an all or nothing on, on that. So uh, to me, I think, I think the price point is, is appealing actually, if you're in the market for like a, you know, not quite luxury end, but better than, you know, mid fi right. I mean, you want to be in that, that gap in between. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think their, their performance is always, spoken to like you know you're you're going to get the quality and i will also say um i just upgraded to a trinov um from a Marantz. um there is some day in day out usability of a Marantz product that i i miss um right i mean it's like it just it, it, there's a there's a, a user friendliness and like you know an app-based control and all this other stuff that like the ultra high-end doesn't really you know want to do i can't airplay to my tree right. <laughs> you know, i can't <laughs> um yeah um but you know i i, I feel like they've they found their niche and they're going to car they're going to carve out a spot at the upper end of it and i i think it'll be a, a great product sure i agree and awesome. the multi UX software, just spend that extra 200 to, to get the PC software to mess with your, uh, with your Odyssey on that because yeah, that, that really opens it up nicely too. The one thing that I wasn't clear on, I mean, we know that uh, Direct Live is coming and Marantz told me that the base module is going to be available, but they didn't discern between the single sub or multi-sub. I'm assuming that it's going to be the, right the, now, but eventually multi-sub was what they told me at the show eventually okay yeah yeah like there you go rack immediately yeah yeah awesome so uh all right guys so to finish things off let's let's just do a, a quick around the uh i guess you'd say around the square <laughs> start with you mark <laughs> your favorite demo room and kind of the most intriguing product that you saw that you saw on the floor uh while you're at the show well uh intriguing uh so it's going to be Eclipse uh, for 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 the demo room. Uh, I'm just a sucker for that traditional movie theater projected presentation brought to its absolute limit. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm going with the the Samsung 110 uh, price not irrelevant. I, I just think that seeing uh, micro LED really packaged as a TV and just uh, having that glimpse of of, uh, of a potential future. Uh, what displays might look like. Uh, yeah. That, that, that really sparked my imagination. Awesome. John. Well, my favorite demo room, I think was the, you know, Sonos Faber, Macintosh, Trinov, Kaleidoscape, um, Cinema Acoustica. I, you know, it had like all the heavy hitters, you know, in there. 
I mean, it looked great. It sounded great. Um, I, I mean, it, they showed us Top Gun Maverick, which nobody else was doing. <laughs> um, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, 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 it delivered on, you know, what, what high end home theater should do. I mean, the bass was big. It was tight. I mean, dialogue was clear. I, I thought, I thought that was great. Um, I, the most intriguing product I saw, I guess, you know, if you were to, if, if the metric for that is what do I most wish I could have come home with, um, it would be that quantum media systems wall. I mean, to me, again, I like you guys, I've been doing this a really long time and it's, it's not often that you see something that is just the best of something you've ever seen before. And I, I don't think I've ever seen video quality that awesome. Um, and so that that to me, I guess, was the most intriguing. And like I said, I, it, that could displace high end projection. You know, when you talk about like crazy high end projection, you know, I think that 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 would make an argument for, you know, if you could have this or that, you know, I'd rather have this. There we go. That's what. All right, Travis. Uh, uh, John, I'm going to go against your uh, favorite room, and I'm going to go with the uh, the Seymour Ascendo. <laughs> Uh, storm audio room i i thought either one of those rooms i would be honored to have any of that equipment here in this room but i felt like the other the the seymour room was just and, and like i mentioned earlier they were both kaleidoscape mad vr barco to to seymour i just felt like the seymour room was executed a little more uh you know on point as far as performance, I the one thing that drove me bonkers about the Trinov room was the blue lighting. It took me mm. I, I saw I saw the the media preview the night before the show opened mm. and I was literally in the last demo before they shut it down. And both times mm. for the first 90 seconds or so, I was blinking those blue lines all through <laughs> my field of vision, trying to get rid of them so I could watch the actual demo. Um, so to me, that was a, a huge flaw that knocked it off the you know it had the most buzz and the longest line absolutely okay. but it had the um, most macintosh amps by far <laughs> that too a lot of a lot of blue lights at that room um a lot of blue lights but uh yeah as far as um most intriguing for me i by default i think i'm gonna have to go with the next level acoustic speakers i actually they shipped five of them to me here to uh awesome to take a listen to and 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 evaluate and demo and see what i can do with them in a little more real world setting so um i think that's uh that's gonna be fun interesting and coming up here in the next you know month or two they're a little more a little more than just setting them up having to put them behind the screen but that'll be fun um also another one that i just Probably the the biggest wow for me was completely off the map was uh, K Array. They had these little speakers that were about the size of this thumb drive, and they had them connected paired with a sub that sounded just like tower speakers. It was mind boggling. Wow. And they, I missed that one. And they and they had uh, these mm -hmm. other speakers, and and Mark, maybe you've uh, heard or seen them. Apparently, the the Eagles have them in their stadium there. Um, they're like these this like the mesh tubing that you get that you can wrap all your cabling in. They they mm -hmm. looked and felt like that. They came in like six eight foot chunks that you can, can that you can just connect them on the end for so for so long. But they sounded absolutely phenomenal. You just add subs, and then these were just like line arrays. Incredible. Wow. It was it was bizarre and kind of bonkers. They were right across from from the storm uh, from Storm's booth um, on the other side of Trinov there, and it was just well, it touches incredible. on one thing. No one person can do the entire show in three yep. days. It's not yeah. possible. No. Yeah, it's yeah. just not possible. Yep. Although Tom, yeah, I feel I, like I, you, I, gave it, you gave it the old college try. I saw you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Yeah, I kept running into Todd, you. Todd tripled the content on our YouTube channel in the last week and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hit I hit uh, twenty twenty six vendors, which was a lot in two days. Wow. Um, so much so that I didn't want to touch any of it for like a week. Just exhausting. Yeah, but uh, so uh, so my favorite. I, ra demo I room... raced back here and watched Ma like literally. I... I raced back to Seattle and I watched Maverick. 
I watched Nora Jones. I pulled up a bunch of the stuff that I had been watching on the in on you know in all the demos on my Kaleidoscape just to compare. You know, when th those were fresh in my mind, okay, what's it sound like here, and where where are the main differences? What could I upgrade? What could I you know what could I push toward to you know reach right. these sounds that I loved at the show? You get inspired by the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very dangerous world to walk around in. That's for sure. Yep. Well, yep. I uh, I picked my favorite demo room. It was the quantum media systems. I mean, I love the Trinov room and the Storm room. They're just incredible uh, Eclipse. But uh, that screen in there, like John, you were saying that it just floored me. Uh, so that was my probably favorite demo experience. Um, and the most intriguing product I saw was actually uh, this is a little off the wall, but it was. It's by a company called Modulus Media Systems, and they oh, had their, yeah. their sure. Modulus M2, which um, it's like a it's like a DVR meets an old version of Kaleidoscape, uh, where you can rip your discs, you can apparently download movies that you've purchased digitally and save them on a drive. Uh, they were showing a 80 terabyte uh, version, and you can add on your own storage. On the back end, the the uh, the guy I talked to there said they have a client who has like 300 terabytes of videos stored up out in, in LA. Um, so, uh, and the price point's right; it's like nine to eleven thousand dollars. I mean, it's a real sweet spot. My my big question is: Are they going to be able to dance around all the the media rights? I mean, you start telling Hollywood studios that you're letting people rip discs onto drives that can be removed and shared. Um, well, that's, that's why Kaleidoscape doesn't uh, have it anymore. When, oh, when, the, when they have to start touting, and this is all legal, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, well, well wait, nobody was thinking. <laughs> now, now I'm wondering if it is. And it's like, you can record Netflix and then cancel your subscription. You can record this. It's like, uh, yeah. It's like so. It did it. It was it was like the magic box. You know, it <laughs> is. I'm curious about. It. I mean, it looked it looked neat enough. It was probably the, so. That's why it was uh, the most intriguing product there for me. I mean, of, of course, yeah. all these other incredible technologies that we all got to see were uh, were really fun. Uh, but that one, I don't know. What do you guys think? Has up to be tested down? in a court. Uh, I, I'm a I'm a. I mean, definitely up, but has to be tested in a court. But I understand that you have the legal right to make a backup of of media you own. Yeah, so that that's what they're running with. Yeah, uh, yeah, but you don't have a legal right to break the copy encryption. That's right. I've been through those conversations. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, and that's. But again, sure. like I said, to me, I I, I was yeah. I'm standing there listening to a spiel, and then he's like, and it's all legal, and I'm like, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> for now. And, I asked him specifically because I've I've reviewed many 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 movie right. servers and I'm like so do you have to sideload like Sly Fox or any DVD? He's like no, it comes out of the box ready to rip things. I'm like mm, okay, you know. So like I think <laughs> it's legal, except at the federal level, it's not legal, and right, that's yeah. what you're going to worry about suing you. Yeah. Is, is the feds, uh, you know, or whatever. Uh, I, I I would love to know more about why they think that they you can do all that yeah. yeah yeah and plus i mean a lot of the digital content that you own you don't actually own it right you own access to the the uh the copy of it that a company has a license to right they've per like apple i mean they yeah. can lose access to a particular movie at any point in time right they don't actually own the content um so i don't know i don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. with that but i don't know we shall have to wait and see on that one. It was a cool looking product. I mean, as they showed it, it was it was a cool looking product for sure. I, I will Shit. say one of the one of the big things that they were touting though was the ability to record things like multiple tuners. And I can tell you in our area, cable card doesn't exist anymore. So it's like, you know, that was a big thing that they were saying it could do off of cable card. And it's like, well, yeah, that technology is kind of dead now. So, you know, it's you know. so the question is if home theater PC didn't make it. It's because of the exact limitations that we're discussing here. Why aren't there home theater PCs as envisioned? You know, uh, because obviously, you know, my video card can do 8K at whatever, 120 hertz. All yeah, it's all there in the PC anyway. Why can't you just, like you said, any DVD that 
UHD Blu-ray if uh, it's all legal. Love mm, to know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, guys, we've pushed up a teeny bit over an hour, so uh, time to stop. But uh, Mark, John, Travis, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to hang out, talk shop. It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah. hopefully uh, everybody watching learned a little something about uh, what we experienced at CD of 2022. I'm super psyched to go to the next show. That's, yeah. that's the thing. No more, no more jaded. <laughs> no, not this right. Yeah. 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 So, you awesome. know, some of the, some of the, the, the big booths at CDO were, you know, they, they delivered on the promises, but you know, like the KRA thing, I enjoyed a lot of the, the unexpected things that you find walking from one big booth to a next, you know, some, sometimes those are the ones that really stick with you. So good times and yeah, can't wait for the next one. Yeah. Awesome. Well, look forward to seeing you guys there in 2023 in Denver. I think it's, uh, September 9 through 11. It's earlier, I remember, yeah. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. And uh, we will have another episode of AV Nirvana Live coming up real soon. And uh, with that, we'll say goodbye. Awesome. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Bye.